Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. The humanitarian coordinator for Yemen, Jamie McGoldrick, today expressed his deep concern over the continuing obstruction to the timely provision of aid to people in need by the parties to the conflict. He said that for months, humanitarian partners have experienced delays by authorities in Sana'a to facilitate the entry of aid workers into Yemen, interference in the delivery of aid and the choice of implementing partners, and hijacking of aid vehicles. Mr. McGoldrick also noted that there have been increased incidents where aid was diverted from the intended beneficiaries in areas under the control of the Sana'a authorities. He also said that as basic social services in Yemen are near collapse, there's mounting pressure on aid agencies to expand the humanitarian response. But he stressed that ensuring unhindered humanitarian access is essential to save the lives of those who depend on assistance, particularly as Yemen is facing an unprecedented cholera crisis and more than 7 million people are at risk of famine. Mr. McGoldrick urged all parties to the conflict to uphold their obligations under international humanitarian law to facilitate the safe and unhindered delivery of humanitarian assistance in areas under their control. You can read his full statement online. The UN Population Fund, or UNFPA, said today that the cholera outbreak in Yemen is putting some 1.1 million malnourished pregnant women in the country at risk. Pregnant and breastfeeding women are especially vulnerable to malnutrition, making them more prone to contracting cholera, which in turn gives them a higher risk of developing dangerous or even fatal complications. You can read more about this on UNFPA's website. The humanitarian community and the government of the Central African Republic have jointly launched the revised 2017 Humanitarian Response Plan today, seeking $497 million to respond to humanitarian needs across the country. The number of people needing humanitarian assistance now reaches 2.4 million as a result of the upsurge of violence that has been affecting several parts of the country since January. The number of internally displaced people has increased to 600,000, a figure last reached in January 2013 at the height of the crisis. Hotspots have multiplied during this period and regions which used to be peaceful have sunk into violence. In cities like Zemio and Kagabandoro, humanitarian assistance is delayed and activities have, have been limited to strictly life-saving ones due to limited access and insecurity. The humanitarian situation around Bangasu continues to deteriorate while in Bria it remains very tense, with the Muslim community threatening to march towards the Biketra IDP site to confront the anti-Balaka elements following the killing of one of their members. This has created a wave of panic in the population, and movements between the city center and the Biketra site have been suspended. I have a few updates from our colleagues at the UN Refugee Agency. First, Filippo Granti paid his first official visit as High Commissioner to Sudan this week at a time when refugees continue to flee the brutal conflict in South Sudan. He called on the international community to recognize Sudan's long-standing tradition of hosting refugees and asked for more support for the country. He stressed that South Sudanese refugees are able to benefit from the government's extension of certain freedoms, including to work and move, and also receive generous support from host communities. Sudan has hosted over 416,000 South Sudanese refugees since 2013, including some 170,000 new arrivals in 2017, making one of the largest refugee-receiving countries in the region. Sudan also continues to host refugees from Eritrea, Syria, Yemen, Chad, and other countries. Meanwhile, UNHCR is today reiterating its call to the international community for urgent additional support for the South Sudan refugee situation in Uganda in particular, where the number of refugees from South Sudan has now reached 1 million. Over the past 12 months, an average of 1,800 South Sudanese have been arriving in Uganda every day, with more than 85% being women and children. For Uganda, $674 million is needed for South Sudanese refugees this year, but so far only a fifth of this amount ha has been received. The funding shortfall is now significantly impacting the abilities to deliver life-saving aid and, basic, and key basic services. In June, the World Food Program was forced to cut food rations for refugees. And finally, a joint, in a joint statement following a high-level dialogue last week, UNHCR and the government of Tanzania called for the continuing, continued protection of refugees and asylum seekers while supporting host communities. They also agreed on the importance of redoubling efforts to seek solutions, such as finalizing the naturalization process for the remaining Burundi refugees from 1972. 
uh, assisting refugees who wish to voluntarily return to their countries of origin and advocating for resettlement to third countries. You can find more details on this on UNHCR's website. Today, the UN Environment Program announced a short list of regional finalists for its Young Champions of the Earth Prize, a global competition to identify, support, and celebrate outstanding individuals between the ages of 18 and 30 with big ideas to protect the environment. 30 regional finalists were selected for having the most innovative, scalable, and potentially impactful ideas, and the public is encouraged to go to UNEP's website to view and rate each of the finalists' proposals and vote for their favorite. Informed by public opinion, a global jury will select six young champions in early September. And I want to flag that tomorrow at 11.30 a.m., the Secretary General will speak at an event at the UN Visitors Lobby to mark World Humanitarian Day, which is on Saturday. To mark the day, our humanitarian colleagues have launched the hashtag not a target online campaign to reaffirm that civilians caught in conflict are not a target and demand that world leaders do everything in their power to protect civilians in conflict. The campaign follows on the UN Secretary General's report on the protection of civilians, which was launched earlier this year. And more, available, uh, more information is available online. And that is it for me. Are there any questions? Yes, Rosalind. Thanks, Farhan. I'm sure you've uh, seen the reports now about the draft Children in Conflict report in which the Saudi-led coalition is being accused of continuing to uh, kill and injure children in the Yemeni civil war. Given that the draft report is not yet out, but given the fact that there has been ongoing consultation between the UN and the Saudi government and with other governments, is it appropriate to allow a country to bargain or threaten its way off a blacklist regarding protection of children when this has been established by Security Council resolution that countries that don't abide by international treaties and and conventions of war regarding civilians isn't the, isn't this unseemly to have something like this happening? I know it happened last year. Should a country be able to argue its way off a blacklist? Well, without relitigating what happened last year, part of the point is that the process this year is still underway. It's a little bit uh, premature to judge what uh, the report is going to say and uh, what uh, will be in the annex because that process is still happening. Uh, the, the draft uh, report, in fact, uh, that uh, had been leaked to the press was not one that was seen by the Secretary General. And as you know, these are reports of the Secretary General. So ultimately, he has to see the contents he goes over it himself, he makes his decisions, and, and the list, of course, uh, the annex, is part of uh, the content that he decides on. Uh, that process is going on. The Secretary General, uh, I believe this week, has received a, a draft and will be looking at it. Uh, he, I think, will see Virginia Gamba, the s special representative on children armed conflict, tomorrow, and they'll discuss it. But this process is going to go on further. I wouldn't expect the report to be completed and handed over uh, to member states until about a month or so from now. And we'll let you know when that is. But ultimately, we want you to be able to judge us by the, the contents of the final report. Uh, at that point, it'll be clear uh, which countries uh, are uh, written up, which countries are included, uh, and how we evaluate their actions. Follow, uh, uh, may I, may I have oh, a sure. quick follow-up? Sure. Is the ongoing consultation process between the UN and member states designed to prevent people from arguing their way off the list? Does this consultation presuppose that placement on the list or non-placement on the list will be done based on the facts of each country's behavior in the past year and not because of some other agreement that might have been reached during this consultative process? The basic point of the list, the report, and the entire process that we go through is that we want effective tools to make member states and non-member parties improve their records regarding how children are treated in different conflict situations. 
when we engage in dialogue with member states, consequently, part of what we're trying to do is to show what is needed for each party to improve its own records. If they can take concrete steps that can help ensure that children themselves will be protected, that actually helps fulfill the purpose of the task that we're trying to do. How they do that is up to each member state in terms of what we feel and they feel are needed in order to improve their records. But, uh, but yes, that's part, a standard part of the process. And we, when we try to do that with a range of states and parties, because ultimately, we don't simply want to come out with a report. We want to have a report that pushes the people who are mentioned in the right direction, which is in the direction of actually improving their records. Yes, Edie. Uh, Farhan, um, as a follow-up to that, and then I had a question on something different. Mm -hmm. um, I noted that last year the report came out in June. It's already August, so why is this being delayed so dramatically now until into September? Well, there's basically two reasons. One is that uh, there's been a new uh, 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 special representative, Virginia Gamba, who came into the office and wanted uh, to be able to have a fresh start and, and look at all of the information uh, with, a, with a new eye. And secondly, uh, part of the process that we're trying to do, especially uh, given the way that uh, different parties feel that they hadn't received adequate information uh, in the past, is, is to let different parties know what is the, the concerns that we have and what needs to be addressed, and see whether they can actually make some progress towards addressing them. Uh, yes, oh, you, you had, oh, oh, I, oh, and you had I another question. I did have another yes. question on Sorry. something different. Um, on Congo and the, the um, letter that the Secretary General sent to the Security Council, he talked about establishing some kind of a follow-up mechanism uh, today the United States and Sweden who are directly involved and quite a number of other countries uh, called on the Secretary General to establish a full investigation under his jurisdiction. Um, can you tell us uh, whether the Secretary General is going to do this? Well. Uh, you're certainly aware that uh, that the Board of Inquiry report uh, uh, has been completed. Uh, the Secretary General, as, as you just mentioned, did transmit a summary of that report to the members of the Security Council ahead of their consideration today of the latest report of the group of experts. In his letter to the Council conveying the summary, the Secretary General said he intends to establish a follow-on mechanism to ensure further determination of the facts relevant to the killings. Uh, as you're aware, the Secretary General spoke uh, a bit uh, about this in his stakeout to the press yesterday, and he made clear that it's in his intention to do everything he can so that those who are responsible for the deaths of Zaida Catalan and Michael Sharp uh, are punished. He's ready to explore with all concerned uh, uh, parties uh, the, the practical follow-up uh, that can ensure accountability. And following consultations with the DRC authorities, which included a meeting, uh, by the way, with the foreign minister of the DRC yesterday, and with members of the Security Council, the Secretary General will present uh, proposals in that regard. And by the way, the executive summary of uh, the report uh, should be available to you in the coming days. Um, obviously, having gotten a copy of the executive summary, read his letter, and listened to what he said, yeah. it, it doesn't answer my question. Uh, my question is that there is significant pressure from the parties most concerned, who are the countries <coughs> of the two murdered UN experts, plus a number of other groups, 
calling for the Secretary General to undertake a full independent investigation. And when do you think we might have an answer on whether he is prepared to do that? First, we'll have to see how the dialogue with the various parties goes. L like I said, he did meet with uh, the DRC foreign minister, uh, Leonard Shea Okutundu, yesterday. And he's continuing the dialogue now. Uh, and we, uh, through our other officials, are continuing dialogue with the various members of the Security Council now. We'll see what sort of mechanism can be created. We believe that there is progress towards the idea of some form of follow-on mechanism, and we'll try to spell out what the particulars of that will be as these discussions proceed. Yeah. Oh, actually, why don't, why don't you, you've had your hand up for a while, and then you. Thank you, Farhan. Um, regarding this Cyprus issue, uh, during the Grand Montana negotiations, the General Secretary seemed to realize that a normal country such as Cyprus, um, an equal member of the United Nations and the European Union, um, cannot operate under its invaders' troops and guarantees. Could you confirm that this right is clear and will it be adopted by the Secretary General and the United Nations in the case of a new round of negotiations in order to come to a solution? Thank you. Uh, thanks. I don't have anything particularly new to say about Cyprus. You'll, you'll have seen what the Secretary General and the outgoing uh, envoy, Espen Bartaida, have said. Uh, if there is any new round of talks, we'll make our positions clear at that point. But uh, where we stand is, is basically where we left off with what they said at that time. Yeah, I'm sorry. I want to follow up question, Matt. Uh, would the United Nations accept the, a normal country it's something that was mentioned many times, a normal country to have a solution under troops and guarantors. That's the question, no matter whether it's Mr. Aida or anyone else. Would the United Nations accept such a scenario? The future of Cyprus will be dependent on negotiations between the parties. How a, an arrangement is, is made ultimately has to be decided by the parties, and we're not going to say anything prejudicial to the process as the parties uh, go to talks. At this stage, as you know, we are in a period of reflection and a period of cooling off. After that, we certainly hope and expect the parties will come back ready to talk to each other. Yes. Sure. I didn't follow up on DRC, but I actually have a follow up on, on Cyprus now first. I wanted to ask you, uh, Inner City Press is, uh, it was leaked to Inner City Press, a document called Leaders Meeting 4.7.2017, which is uh, Mr. Ida, it purports to be, and I'd like you to, uh, uh, Mr. Ida conveying what he, he understood from, from Antonio Guterres, including by text message, that uh, on troops, Mr. Guterres wanted to, uh, a reduction to the level of those under the old Treaty of Alliance, the levels of 1960, and, and any number of other issues. And since this document, I guess I'd like you to, given the importance of the issue, is that, is that his position? And now that Mr. Ida is no longer in the position, uh, is this his document? Is that the final position of the Secretary General? Uh, f first of all, I don't have any comment on, on leaked documents. Mm -hmm. Second of all, uh, like I just uh, told your colleague, mm -hmm. ultimately the, the positions of a dip in a diplomatic process are ones that will be evolved through discussions with the parties themselves. I wouldn't have any uh, uh, comment on what the state of play may have been four or five months ago. Uh, di diplomatic processes evolve over time. Sure, on DRC. What I wanted to, this is, I, it's not, it's obviously not leaked since everybody has it and you say you're putting it out. The, the summary of the DRC uh, well, well right. it, it is leaked because you have it already. We are putting it okay, out in a few so days. So I want to ask you about paragraph 24, just because it, it is everywhere. And it says that it seems like one of the, the one sort of self-criticism that the report makes is that, quote, groups, members of the groups of experts do not believe that the UN security management system regulations pertain to them. And since it, it was unclear from the report, do they actually pertain to them? Did they, in March 2017, did these... these uh, security management system regulations apply to them, and if, if they did, whose job was it to tell them if they didn't understand that? Was it DSS? Was it DPA? Yes, and we're looking at how the system works to make sure that 
that throughout the system, all the offices are able to inform uh, UN employees of what the appropriate security rules are. Part of what we need to do is make sure that uh, that people like ex the experts are aware of how the how the security norms apply, so that everyone has security policies. Beyond that, I'll I would just stick to what the report is. Can saying. Mr. Starr do a press conference? Mr. Starr, uh, Mr. Starr uh, was there just for this exercise. He's not a, an employee of, of right, the, the United report. Nations, and we don't have the authority to do that. Yes. Thanks, Farhan. Uh, the Libyan Coast Guard has recently expanded its search and rescue uh, area for migrants and refugees in the Mediterranean, and uh, they've been threatening NGO ships. Uh, Yesterday, a Spanish one, also recently Italians, Germans, MSF has left, uh, Save the Children has left. Has the UN approached the Libyan government uh, about this? And I, I know there's a switch in the SRSGs right now, but uh, has, has OCHA talked to them? Have, has the SRSG talked to them? What, what's your position on this uh, intimidation of NGOs trying to help refugees and migrants? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll check and see what our Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is doing about this. But beyond that, of course, we do have concerns to make sure that uh, all uh, non-governmental organizations and all humanitarian workers are able to go about their work uh, without uh, fear and, and without hindrance. Uh, and so we want to make sure that uh, the authorities, and as you know, in Libya, there's a, a variety of different authorities on the ground and in the waters, uh, that, uh, that they're able to allow for regular NGO activity and humanitarian access. Yes, Rosalind. Uh, since you uh, brought up the uh, situation in Central African Republic, given that armed groups control about 70% of the country outside of Bangui, what can the UN do to try to deal specifically with these groups, to try to get them to engage in the political process, to engage in political reconciliation, to stop attacking UN peacekeepers and aid workers, and to look out for the best interests of the Central African people, rather than trying to hold on some small part of the country? Well, the UN has been working uh, at different levels, at, at the regional level and even at the local level, with different leaders trying to make sure that uh, the efforts by different spoiler groups, uh, whether ex celica, anti balaka, or otherwise, uh, does not derail the, the the peace efforts that we've made in the country and the stabilization efforts we've made in the country over the past years. And we're going to continue with that work, uh, through, you know, both through our political efforts, through uh, through the uh, the work done by the UN mission, MINUSCA, to try to stabilize the situation in the areas where they operate. Uh, but also, of course, the, uh, the national authorities will have to play their part to making sure that uh, ultimately the, the, the country can be brought under uh, a single leadership that, that all parties can feel represented in. But there has been concern that the central government lacks considerable capacity and, by extension, doesn't have the amount of credibility where one armed group or another would be willing to actually give up part of its power, part of its control, in order to engage in some sort of reconciliation effort. What is the UN doing specifically to help shore up the credibility of the central government? Yeah, yes. Uh, you're right that that's a problem, not just of this government, but of, of many governments in conflict situations. and. Uh, Throughout uh, those cases, what we try to do is work with uh, the, the host government and, and see what can be done to, to bring more areas under the control of, of government authorities. Ultimately, we need to make sure that the, the forces of the spoilers are either brought in from having their concerns addressed or are aware that there will be accountability for trying to continue to foment violence, uh, continue to create hostility in different areas and, and create a situation that's dangerous for the population in those areas. Yeah. Sure. I want to ask about Kenya and then about the Anglap Sang case. Uh, as you know, in, in, as, you, as you may know in Kenya, the, the um, former or future DPA employee, Rosalind Akambe, who was given a, a leave of absence to work on the electoral commission there, 
attempted to leave the country and was detained at the airport. It's now said that she's come to New York for meetings. So I wanted to know two things. Number one, is she having any meeting with the UN since you said she's coming to New York for on, on official business? Number two, when she was given this leave of absence, it's become quite controversial, as you, as you know, the commission is getting sued for being not less than, less than impartial. Um, was there any, did the ethics office look at this, at this granting of a, of a, of a leave of absence? What, what's her current status with the UN? And also, it's come up because she ap appealed to the US embassy there. For purposes of UN, is she, is she uh, from Kenya or from the United States? Uh, I wouldn't have any comment on her nationality. I don't comment on the, on the nationalities of staff members. Given that the person uh, was detained but, and... Uh, okay. But um, I am aware that uh, she was on a leave of absence. At, at some point, uh, I, believe, uh, I believe fairly soon, it will be expiring, and then she will return to her duties in the Department of Political Affairs. So she has no contacts in the UN during this week, because it's, it's a big story in Kenya that she's come to New York, and she says she's coming to New York for work related to the election. So I guess my question to you is, does this New York visit have any UN connection? I, I, I wouldn't comment on her work until she's rejoined the United Nations. She's, she's not... At the time that she's on leave, she is a, a, a separate individual. Uh, Ms. Ms. Akambe at some point will re rejoin the Department of Political Affairs and then she'll be a UN staffer. Sure, and I wanted to ask, now that the, the, the Aung Lap Seng verdict has been rendered, uh, InterCity Press has been obtaining the exhibits. And I wanted to ask you, because even going back and looking at the audit, several things were not solved. One, number one, is there's now a, there's a specific emails uh, involving current DGACM employee Mina Sewer to Francis Lorenzo regarding the, the insertion of the name Sun Yang Yang Group into a GA document, that, which is, you know, that's referenced in the, in the audit. Many people say Mr. Batanaru retired. That's why nothing was ever done. I guess what I want to know is what, what's been done. Is there some explanation, again, of a current UN official having worked on the insertion of this, this company name into a GA document improperly? Re regarding the, the general issue, without getting into the cases of specific individuals, uh, the fact is the Department of Management has followed up on the various uh, conclusions brought in by, by these, these reports and has, and has made sure that, that all actions uh, are properly undertaken. There's another email, which is the, the Global Compact responded to, to uh, Francis Lorenzo, actually, but about, about Sun Kyanian Group joining the Global Compact. And it said, we'll get back to you after a review of one or two weeks. So I wanted to know, in terms of the Global Compact, given that Sun Kyanian Group is involved in casinos and other businesses, what review on the front end, I know that it's often said once you join the Global Compact, the only thing that's required is the filing of reports, not any substantive. But what what review is done if, in fact, you know, a, a casino business uh, itself already involved in controversy at the time can join? Well, I believe the Global Compact on its own website tells you exactly what uh, its priorities are and, and what, um, what it asks of incoming members. So I would just refer so you to that. So how did they join? No, ju just, just look at the website. It'll, it, sh it shows you what it expects from incoming members. Have a good afternoon, everyone.